All right. Hello, Mark Romero here. Thank you so much for being here. I am so excited. Every once in a while, I'm starting to inject them more and more. I'm bringing on just people who are really committed to providing resources, knowledge, wisdom to help us all to restore harmony in our body, our mind, and our spirit, ultimately so that we can play more beautiful music throughout every aspect of our lives. And today is no exception to the rule. We have a dynamic duel here, uh, really having an opportunity to bring forward some information I think is going to inspire you on your health, perhaps maybe give you some insight and some wisdom, ultimately that can help you to create more vibrant health in your experience. And, but before we get started, I thought I would uh, summarize a little bio here to get a sense of who we're having an opportunity to sit with today. So today I'm joined by uh, Dahlia Morin and James Morin. Uh, they are the co-founders of the Integrative Dietetics, uh, did I say that right? Yes, I did, Dietetics yeah. Practice, Married to Health, and the first 100% plant-based SIBO slash IBS We'll find out what that is more about later, I'm sure. Nutrition program. As gut health dietitians, Dolly and James' goal is to spread knowledge about the importance of incorporating plant foods to support a healthy cut, a gut microbiome and help those with gut issues to get back to a thriving gut microbiome. And of course, that means more vibrant health. I'm so excited to have you two here. Thank you so much for joining me today. Love it. Thank you for that intro. Yes. We're we're happy to be here. Thanks for having us. I think this is like the first time I'm having a married couple on. Uh, this could just <laughs> open up all kinds of learning opportunities. For <laughs> I'm excited to, to really dive in. I think, you know, one of the areas that I love to start is as we go through our lives, there are certain things that happen that I don't want to say force us down a certain path, but shall we say sometimes nudge us, sometimes maybe shove us down. I'm curious to know how you two really kind of found yourselves on this path, not only doing what you do, but together and what it is that you bring forward. What's the story behind this? So, you know, I always... I always go first. I always share my story of I was my very first own patient because early on in life, I found myself emotionally eating. I'm a first generation American. I was a latchkey kid and, you know, the TV and food were my babysitters. So I would sit at home and kind of just entertain myself. And that combination plus a pretty sedentary lifestyle led me to eventually become an overweight child, an obese teen, and a very unhealthy um, early college student. And so here I am, I'm trying to embark on my career and learn. And I was a psychology student and I went to the doctor one day because I was having something weird going on. I was like, hmm, I don't think I should be hearing my blood rushing by my eardrum. Something's off. So I went to see an ear, nose and throat doctor. He quickly pointed out, hey, you have a huge thyroid goiter. You need to go see an endocrinologist. So I did. And for the first time really in my life, I had comprehensive blood work done, all kinds of testing done. And then I went for my follow-up thinking, oh, okay, he'll probably tell me one little thing. And he was like, guess what? You have polycystic ovarian syndrome. You're pre-diabetic. You have high cholesterol. You have an autoimmune thyroid condition. And here are three medications. Go home, take these, come back in a month, and we'll see how you're feeling. And I left that office in shock. I was like, what? <laughs> Not expecting that. I thought I'm too young to be dealing with all these issues, but it really did add up. My lifestyle was one that really fostered that. And so I went home for the first month. I was a good patient. I took my medication and, you know, going into all those diagnoses, you don't feel well, but I felt even worse on all of these medications. So I went back and I was like, what else can I do? And, you know, he's like, well, just, you know, play with your doses of your medication. So I started researching on my own and I was like, hmm, maybe I shouldn't be eating 90% processed food. And maybe I should try incorporating more whole foods in my diet. And I just really slowly started learning, okay, I'm going to not eat fast food. I'm going to try to, I'm going to cut out sugar sweetened beverages. I'm going to add in some veggies. And from there, I just kept it going. And sure enough, once I started feeling better and, you know, losing some weight and losing some of those medications and losing some of my depression and gaining energy, I was like, hmm, there's something to this. So I took a nutrition class just for my own information over the summer. And I was like, you know what? Psychology is cool and it's great, but really there's 
there's a psychology of eating and I want to learn more about nutrition and how to nourish myself and all the thought and energy that goes into that. And really before I even knew it, I wanted to heal with each meal. And that really is kind of the thought process with married to health. So that's when, you know, our stories converge and, you know, we, James can pick it up from there, but I, like you said, was shoved into this out of necessity. Uh, yeah. So and, go ahead, James. I'm sorry. And for me, just, no, was, yeah, yeah. Not, not as, <laughs> not as uh, in, or I don't want to say in depth, but like, or severe as Dahlia, but, but on that trajectory for sure, like growing up in the nineties, you know, eating all the different colored foods that don't make sense that are in packages that are tasty, but they're like, you know, fruit roll-ups and fruit by the foot and all the candies and artificial and dyes. It was, yeah, we joke around like our diet consisted of sugar and plastic growing up, which is, which is very odd. And so I, I was experiencing some symptoms. I was I was obese as a child. I remember in third grade weighing about 115 pounds in third grade and not feeling well, right? Like I was always sick. I had joint pain. So there was some things going on just like, man, I, I do not look well. I don't feel well. I was also experiencing some depression, anxiety as well. And when I started realizing like, oh, you can exercise and start to build muscle and and feel better and yeah if i don't eat these candies all the time and just all this sugar all the time you start to just feel better and so it was really just us being our own patients and and running these nutrition experiments on ourselves um fast forward we're both studying nutrition we both meet early on in that journey in college and we had like three classes together, became really good friends and then started fostering something more. But we were both on that trajectory of like, we need to heal ourselves mm-hmm. and there's power. We're like discovering this amazing power in connection to food. And it really is that story of realigning with food, realigning with your energy, realigning with who you are and, and what's going on inside of you, even getting into the stress and trauma and emotions on top of the nutrition and and we're still on that that journey and married to health our company now and our practice is just another layer of that continued path and that continued journey so yeah it, it always amazes me how the challenges in our life the li- you know that as that we encounter you know like i was an overweight kid growing up you know i was like horrible at sports i remember playing baseball the ball would go by and then i would swing i mean there was just no hope for me at all. And it wasn't until I started making those modifications in my own eating, in my own diet, stop eating for comfort, you know, in these different aspects. I, I think one of the, I think we live in though in a time, as you mentioned, it was funny, you were talking about the plastic and the colors and stuff, but it seems like even today it's worse than ever to really find nutritious food that's vibrant that's going to uplift you that's going to help you to to restore harmony to your body and your mind and spirit and it's like how do we navigate that i love this concept and this idea of heal with each meal maybe Mm -hmm. you can share a little bit about what that means but i'm like really curious like how do we even do that in a world where everything comes wrapped in plastic and seems to have preservatives in it it's like uh, it must be possible. I know there's a way, but I don't know. I was curious to hear your thoughts, but I guess, first of all, what does it mean to heal with each meal? I think there's so much that goes into heal with each meal of, you know, what are you eating? Ask yourself all those questions. Who, what, when, where, why, how are you eating? For so many of my patients, we have a conversation of, all right, when you're eating emotionally, why are you eating? Have you stopped to ask yourself that question? Are you actually hungry? Are you overwhelmed? Are you angry? Are you apathetic? What are the emotions behind it? What are you eating? I always say your food is like your roommate. And how is your relationship with that food? Because these foods are there every single day. And with someone you want to cohabitate with, you know, we know you and Laura, Mark are, you've decided, Hey, I like you as a roommate. I want to see you every day. You don't make me feel awful. I I enjoy being around you. That's a roommate status. You're giving basically that open access to your home and food is very much the same. So if you don't have that healthy relationship with a food, it's kind of like inviting someone to live in your home that you don't have a healthy relationship with. Hey, you know, I don't feel great after I see you. I feel really regretful. I feel angry. You give me all these unhealthy emotions. 
maybe we need boundaries. Maybe you're a weekend friend that I just see sometimes and then we go our separate ways. Maybe you're that family member who I just see at the holidays because really I can't see you more than that. You're just offensive and annoying. Um, maybe you're that person that I just really need to go no contact with. And we have to keep it real with ourselves. How is food making you feel? And if you're so dissociated from your body, you're eating emotionally constantly, it's hard to really gauge your relationship. It's almost like an abusive relationship that you can find yourself in. You're so engulfed in it. It's just such a regular part of your day. You don't even really realize that it's dysfunctional. Um, so, you know, what are you eating? Why are you eating it? How are you eating it? Are you eating mindfully? Are you slowing down? Are you chewing your food? Um, you know, are you eating on the go where you have that movie theater syndrome and you look down and you're like, wait, who ate all the popcorn? It was me, right? So ask yourself those questions, go through that gamut and really assess, again, open up your pantry, open up your fridge. Are these foods deserving of roommate status? Because I really enjoy being around them and they make me feel really great. Um, so Heal With Each Meal really encompasses all of that. And in Heal With Each Meal, we always talk about feel with each meal. Again, going into those questions, really asking yourself, because I can relate to that. I used to be so out of touch with my body. It really took James when we were dating to help me realize that after every meal, I would say my stomach hurt. I didn't realize I had irritable bowel syndrome. I didn't realize I had a ton of gut issues until he was like, you tell me almost every single meal that your stomach hurts. And you know, sometimes it does when you're out of touch with your health, you're out of touch with your food. You don't realize that you're in pain constantly and you're not healing with each meal. You're suffering with each meal. So you really want to flip the script. But first, that takes that time for you to step back and create some awareness. Um, so I feel like once you really start creating that awareness, then you are more mindful. Again, just like you create awareness in relationships, you create boundaries with people and you're more aware of who you allow access to yourself. So the same is going to go for your food, your kitchen, your home, and your body. Um, so the food is out there. There's a ton of incredible food, especially where we live in California, you know, Southern California, we don't really have many true seasons. So we have access to all types of beautiful foods. There are farmers markets year round, which a lot of people don't have. So they're there. It's really just a person resolving to create boundaries with some of those processed foods. Cause we know that, you know, 70% of the American diet is hyper processed, ultra refined food. And less than 3% of Americans are eating those whole foods. So now it's, and I would say really quickly, like that, that's a good step one. So, right. It starts inward. And as you work your way out, step one, and then, and then some, some just really uh, tangible tips is that we, we call it like a farmer's market approach, right? If you're lucky enough to go to an actual farmer's market, you're, you're not going to see hyper refined foods there at the farmer's market for the most part. 90 plus percent of what you're finding at the farmer's market is locally grown in season whole foods, right? So the farmer's market is a great gauge of how should I be eating, right? You should be eating 90 plus percent whole foods, not hyper refined night, not ultra processed, right? So you're finding things that are in season, you're finding things at the peak of their nutrient value and nutrient density, flavor and taste. And so what you're going to find at the farmer's market, and, and there are some, you know, ebbs and flows, even here in Southern California, right, you're not going to find a pomegranate in the middle of summer, you're not going to find a persimmon in the middle of summer, you're not going to find a watermelon in January, you're eating them at the peak of when they are the best to eat. And the farmer's market is a really good guide for that. If it's not there, you, know, you probably shouldn't be eating it, right? Or if it's not there, it's probably not in season. And if you are finding it somewhere else, it's probably been flown in thousands of miles. It's been picked months ago, and it's not really the best to be eaten at that time. So, and then it keeps going from there, right? From tips overall to heal with each meal, but yeah. But that awareness I think is, is so important. You know, yesterday I was talking with one of my patients, he's a native American Indian and he lives here in Southern California. But when he goes back and visits, he was telling me just people resolve to feel this way. They just kind of say we'll survive, but you know, so many of them are on dialysis. They have diabetes, you know, they're having amputations and he's like, you don't have to choose this. Yes. You do live in a little bit of a food desert, but the whole foods are there. It's just a disconnect between wanting them and not. There's a couple of things that come up off what you just shared, because as I mentioned earlier before the show, uh, my daughter has issues. And when she brought it to our attention, she actually said, 
you know, I just thought it was normal mm -hmm. to not feel good after eating. Mm -hmm. Like, no, <laughs> you know, okay, let's take a look at this. Yeah. And so I can really see how the key piece is really being awareness. So in essence, what you're saying, we should really feel good after every meal. We should really have yeah. energy. We shouldn't have a turbulent stomach in there. Maybe might make some noises here and there and stuff. Mm -hmm. But all in all, we really should be feeling vibrant after every meal. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that seems to be the easy, but I, I guess it's like, if you don't really think about it, or if you don't have the awareness or the sensitivity with your own physical health, that you might go for time. And that just might seem like the norm, like it did for my daughter. My, yeah. my other question is, is what do you recommend to people who don't have the farm to market in the parking lot, you know, down the street, you know, obviously we do here. Mm -hmm. It's such a prevalent model, but a lot of people live in places where they're importing food in and you know my in-laws live in iowa i mean mm -hmm. you know they don't get produce like what we do here yeah they got great corn but even then i don't know about corn you know but still it's like what do you recommend to the person that that doesn't have those those types of selections available to them i i would say i would start with I would guarantee at any, whether it's a local tiny store or you're in like a rural area and there's only like one corner store or you're in an area where there's just, you know, big chain markets and that's all you have. Uh, there's no like farmer's market or, or mom and pop shop. Um, really, there are going to be dried lentils. There's going to be dried beans. There's going to be dried uh, grains. Uh, you will have some type of fruit or vegetable, even if it's frozen, right? So we want to, focus on that where many times it is cheaper than going out to eat or going to that fast food or even a, lo a lot cheaper than what else you're, is in the grocery store that you could be buying. So those dried, you know, legumes and peas and lentils and beyond are there. You're probably just not noticing them. They're not prime time eye level. You're not seeing them right in those, in those, like that kiosk and right when you walk in, right? Like she's all that. Yeah, flashing light. Ooh, sale on. There's on no marketing lentils. team behind yeah. lentils. <laughs> right. So, so there are tons of options there. I guarantee it. It's just again shifting that focus, mm -hmm. right? Shifting that perspective and going, oh wow, not only will I save money, but there are healthy foods here, and then I can learn. We all have these supercomputers right with us, where like. I can actually learn how to do this and it's not that difficult, right? And it, and you start to just build these new habits. So yeah, anywhere you are, especially in the US, I guarantee it's there and you can find it and it'll probably save you money as well. Uh, mm -hmm. Excellent, this is so great. Um, you know, you mentioned something earlier also about emotional eating. Mm -hmm. And now that's been something that was like for me that I had to work through was how to mm -hmm. better process my emotional energy without trying to stuff it down with food mm -hmm. and then stuff it down with something that wasn't good for me. I was just curious, what kind of advice do you recommend to people who maybe do some comfort eating, who maybe look at food and utilize it, I guess, to put it bluntly, to use it as a drug in essence, to prevent them from feeling what it is that they need to feel. And then let's face it, there are some things, ice cream, sugar drinks that might be better at at numbing out as opposed to maybe lentils or something. What do you recommend in that type of situation? So I always ask more questions before I give answers to people of when did you learn that, right? Because usually it's a learned behavior. Uh, most people will say, my parents taught me to comfort eat because when my emotions were too big for them, they would give me ice cream. They would, you know, pacify me with cookies or whatever it was. So really thinking back to where you learned the behavior and a time in your life where you were using it a lot more frequently than other times, what was going on in your life at that time and your coping skills at that time. Maybe you didn't have the coping skills. So it's important to look back with understanding and also to give grace and not with judgment to say, well, if I started this as a small child or I really tapped into this as a teen, 
I didn't have proper coping skills at that time. Now that I'm an adult, it's my time to learn other appropriate avenues for those emotions. So instead of emotional eating, now let me call it for what it is. Let me be honest with myself. And I love that analogy that you gave, Mark, of you really are stuffing those emotions and burying them under this food. Um, So let me call it for what it is. I'm emotionally eating. And let me find another outlet to release those emotions rather than just stuffing them down and covering them up. So whether that's journaling, talk therapy, emotional release, sound healing, dancing, crying, you know, what have you, um, pick something to where you can let it go. So it's not just festering inside of you. And, you know, it really is, it is like any type of coping mechanism, whether it is alcohol or it's drugs or, you know, anything else that someone's pleasure seeking to kind of distract themselves. These foods, especially hyper refined foods are meant to do just that. They are meant to release a lot of dopamine in your brain to where you just feel happy and numbed out. And, you know, you're not meant to feel that sadness that you feel in that time after you eat that candy bar or whatever hyper refined food. So really it's being honest with yourself and then really assessing what other resources you have. And and I want to point out too, this is, this is a real and studied area of medicine and health, right? So we mm-hmm. spend a lot of time in the peer reviewed research and childhood adverse events are significantly associated with elevated chronic disease, right? So Mm -hmm. basically saying if you experience especially major trauma or sexual abuse, physical abuse, even just verbal abuse as a child or any form of neglect, that is associated with a higher risk of chronic disease, right? So if you're not able to process that, and typically we find these statistics of these children who are abused are then in further further abuse, whether that's in other relationships or just in life with with decision-making and are just kind of in the cycle of abuse, you are then likely to have a cycle of chronic disease. And so it's really, it's studied, it's there in the science, as well as it can seem logical for many of going like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm kind of in this negative dark cloud and it does start to cloud other areas of your life. And that cloud just kind of follows you if you let it, right? So it is like Dahlia saying, taking that action and be like, you know, cloud go away, or I'm going to get an umbrella, or I'm going to kind of switch gears a little bit and get away from this, this dark cloud. Um, so a lot of power there, a lot of power is coming from you. And just that, that awareness is that first step, like we're saying, and then going from there. So, yeah. Excellent. You know, it's like, I remember my mom telling me, son, if you sweep enough stuff under the carpet, eventually that carpet's going to burst somewhere. Hmm. It's going to break out in some way in shape or form. And I think that's obviously what's happening with people on a physical level for you two and the work that you're doing, it looks like IBS is a, a big outward picture of that breaking mm-hmm. through. And is it SIBO or SIBO? What's the key to that? It's SIBO. It's so it stands Ebo. for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And now we're finding it can be bacterial, it can be fungal, it can be other types of microbes, but we're seeing people have imbalance in their gut for sure. And that being in part, um, uh, about the quality of food that we're eating, about comfort eating, doing these different aspects, it all comes. I like, I like to give this this picture of like, you know, and I love it. And it's a great transition as we're talking about trauma, right? Like you're, you're a kid, even when you're a toddler or elementary school, junior high, and imagine we're all carrying around this terrarium, right? If you've ever seen a terrarium, a self-sustaining ecosystem, that is literally what we're carrying around. It's just inside of us. So much so that humans are classified as super organisms. So we're organism, we're one organism, or we seem to be one organism, but we're actually made up of thousands, if not millions, of other ecosystem and organisms, right? We're talking about microbes, we're talking about trillions of organisms. So we are classified as a super organism. So as you're carrying this terrarium with you, If you're falling down a lot, if you're getting abused a lot, your terrarium is getting abused. It's getting cracks. It's getting holes. Maybe little critters are getting in your terrarium that shouldn't be there. So by the time you are an adult or a young, uh, you know, adolescent, 
you've, you've had some trauma, you've had some abuse. So, you know, you start to develop a lot of these GI issues, you know, on top of the fact that GI issues are really connected to mental health. We have more pathways going from the gut to the brain than the brain to the gut. So, so much so that a lot of the research is saying really our gut is our second brain. And so that's where you get this, this idea and really these phrases of like, I have a gut feeling, right? I have butterflies in my stomach. That is not by chance. It's not just a play on words. It's actually rooted in science. So, you know, we are seeing this massive connection, this, this really this, what we like to call the inner ecosystem that we are fostering that really helps us develop, not just proper gut health, but really all health on the planet. We like to say really the gut is the nexus of all health on the planet because we as humans are really the only animals on this planet that can change the planet so rapidly, right? You don't see rabbits making farm farmlands, right? Or like CAFOs or we're doing concentrated feeding lots and operations. We don't see deer digging dams and diverting whole river systems so that we can grow agriculture, right? It's humans doing this and we're doing this based on our appetite and what we want to eat. So a lot there, but most definitely. And, you know, when we're messing with all that, our environment, our ecosystem, that will lend ways to our gut being affected by it. You know, the number one cause of irritable bowel syndrome and that small intestinal bacterial overgrowth is post-infectious gastroenteritis. So after somebody gets food poisoning, which, you know, you're more at risk for that when someone else is handling your food, right? We hear about fast food restaurants having outbreaks from employees not washing their hands or, you know, um, when you're not properly washing your produce or if you're traveling and you pick up a bug. So that can leave lasting effects. I think people think, oh, well, I got it all out, right? Came out of both ends of me and I'm fine. But these bacteria or viruses, they leave behind little toxins that stick to the little nerves in your gut and that can affect the movement in your gut, the motility. Um, and so then- you. Oh, good. Curious. I have to ask this. So, how yeah. does this show up for people? How does this, you know, it's kind of like I go back to the example of my daughter. She thought it was normal. How do people mm -hmm. know when something's off? What are the symptoms, especially of IBS and SIBO? I guess you pronounce it right. Yeah. So, you know, how, what are the, what's the difference between, you kind of explain what the difference is, but what are the symptoms? How would somebody get an idea that something's off there? Yeah, so they're synonymous. Um, studies show up to 70% of irritable bowel syndrome is SIBO. Because what is IBS? It's basically just your doctors ruled out that you don't have inflammatory bowel disease, right? You don't have Crohn's or colitis. You don't have gastritis or reflux. Your bowels are irritable. It's kind of just like a, I don't know, your bowels are irritable. So we now are knowing, well, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth is a large percentage of that. So again, people can get it different ways. Antibiotics are a huge thing that contribute to that imbalance in that gut terrarium, if you will, anything that affects nerves. If you've had injuries, um, neck injuries or car accidents that give you whiplash, um, all of these can throw off the three main parts of a well-functioning gut. So balance of the microbes, which we call eubiosis. When they're out of balance, it's called dysbiosis. They need to be in good flow or have good motility and you need to have a good structure. So the terrarium needs to be intact. And when they're off, you'll experience things like gas and bloating on a very frequent basis, right? And I always say there's a difference between distension and bloating. You might grow a little bit after you've eaten, you've just put a whole plate or bowl of food in your stomach, but it should go down after you eat. But if you're saying I wake up with a flat stomach and then after breakfast, I look three months pregnant after lunch, I look six. And after dinner, I look nine months pregnant. That really compounding dis bloat and sensation of bloat and appearance of distension is abnormal. If you're noticing your bowels are changing, some days you have diarrhea, other days you're constipated, or you have one or the other, that is really not uh, normal. If you're having reflux all the time or lots of body pains, you've been diagnosed with an autoimmune disease. These are all signs that one of those three functioning parts with your gut microbiome is off. We also want to, want to do more on like, what, what is a good bowel movement? What does it feel like? What does it look like? Right. And mm -hmm. so that's so important. I know it's something that I, go I don't, deep. yeah, I don't think we talk <laughs> about enough and it seems simple or, or I know to us, but we've had a lot of patients and just people online who are like, you mean it's not good to strain? Like I shouldn't push? And and so really, yeah, you, you shouldn't be pushing when you have a bowel movement. You know, your stools to just 
it should just feel great. It should feel wonderful. It should come right out. And overall, you're done in in minutes, not not dozens of minutes, not 30 plus minutes, not an hour, right, of back and forth on the toilet to have a bowel movement. And so I think surprisingly for us, a lot of people are like, wait, what? And I never look or people will tell me that I'm like, pull out your flashlight because I want to know, is it is it sm smeary when you wipe? Is it like peanut butter? Is there mucus? Is it complete? Tell me all about your poop. Is it falling apart? Is there anything in it? Because those all give us clues and signs as to what's going on. But yeah, overall, a good user going on down a whole different avenue. Oh, yeah. Talk about poop all day. <laughs> Talk about poop. What goes in influences what comes out. It's so important because a, a great poo should be not straining. You're not pushing. It comes right out. It's quick. It's overall not messy, not too messy. And uh, and you're done, right? That's that's a great poo overall. <laughs> who, would, who would think? Now I've, I'm... I'm approaching new boundaries that I've never touched base other than a discussion <laughs> in the family or whatever. So I'm curious because you, obviously we talk about this and I think all of us to one degree know what it's like to have a disharmonious, you know, digestion thing process going on at one time or another in our lives. So how is the plant-based approach? How does that help in dealing with this? So our goal is to help people eat and tolerate more plants because nowadays you have a lot of people saying, well, go carnivore or go keto and all your symptoms will go away. It will heal you. And we always say absence of symptoms is not healing because that again. absence of symptoms is not healing. Just because you stopped eating the thing that was challenging your gut, it doesn't mean you're healed. It just means you're avoiding it. And you know, the analogy we like to give is, is it's like you got yourself into really deep debt and instead of heading it on and facing it and creating a plan to pay it off, you kind of just change your email and your address and your phone number. And you're like, well, they can't contact me. So I'm not in debt anymore. I'm, I'm not getting the messages. I'm healed. I'm healed of you're my debt. You're up your, your notices in the mail and you're just avoiding it. Oh, I'm healed. Right? And we know that's just not true, right? Just because you're not hearing about the debt doesn't mean you're out of debt. So the same goes for avoiding fiber. Just because you're not feeling the blow and the discomfort because your body struggles to digest fiber, it doesn't mean you have a well-functioning gut. So our goal is to help people really reach 80 plus percent plants in their diet because the data is consistent no matter the pattern if it's mediterranean if it's full vegan if it's you know a dash diet they're all very plant-centered we know that centenarians throughout our entire world those who live to at least 100 years old they have a plant predominant diet they're eating at least 80 percent plants so if you can't get there that's going to affect your longevity going to affect every system in your body. It will affect your quality of life. So if we need to get you there, we need to figure out why you can't digest the plants and then how to add them in slowly but surely to where somebody is reaching that level. And they're not just eating them, they're tolerating them without those signs of discomfort that we mentioned. So are we really looking to lessen more and more our eating of meats and stuff like that? You, you did say around this 80% point, What's the other aspect? Is that like, uh, do you recommending going completely plant-based and getting away from meats as a whole, or at least lessening? You know, I think a lot of people are heavily meat-oriented dieters, mm -hmm. you know. Um, I'm just kind of curious to hear what your take is on that. I mean, I'll, I'll kind of start with the idea of what what is best for everyone, right? And I think really with what we're seeing with with the data and just what's out there, even those who are very much carnivore focused or like eat me, eat me. And a lot of them are pushing regenerative organic. So this idea, which we love, and we agree with that, eat high quality beef and beef liver. If and you are going to eat it. And, and, you know, all these items. So it's like, okay, great. What does that look like? Well, they're eating grass. They're eating different herbs and cloves and, and these cows are drinking fresh water. Like how, how is that going to work if someone's eating an all meat diet, or let's say it's a 90% meat diet and it's regenerative organic, is that going to work for the seven plus billion people on this planet? And the answer is no. So really it defaults back to those animal products are great. Those high quality animal products, if you're going to eat animals, choose high quality, but it should be reversed. You're doing an 80% plant-based diet and then 
adding the animal products, right? So we're kind of flipping that. That is how really the world is a regenerative organic model and it fits for a lot more people, not just a select few people that you're seeing online eating tons of butter and, and liver and things like that. And so it differs person to person. We have people who are thriving 100% plant-based. Yep. You know, we've been 100% plant-based for about 13 years now. And, you know, we raised our daughter 100% plant-based. It's really just appropriately planning it, right? And we know that throughout the world, really, our Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics agrees properly planned plant-based diets are appropriate at any age and stage. But if you're having... 80% processed vegan food, that's not great for your health. That's not conducive right. for your health. So animal ethics aside, that 20, the rest of the 20% can look like whatever that person can sustain. If it's high quality plant proteins, great. If it's 20% animal products that are of better quality, not only to the person, to the animal during their life, to the environment that they're leaving behind, then there's no data that shows that that 20% is damaging to health at all. I think it just, at the end of the day, it's that person's ethics and what they want to choose. Got it. You know, there was a piece I saw in a documentary, it wasn't too long ago, actually, and it was a plant-based bodybuilder. Mm -hmm. And he, and people say, well, you know, especially with bodybuilding, there's an association that you have to eat a lot of meat protein and whey and all these different things. And he said, no, he goes, you don't. He says, you know, I want to be as strong as an ox. How much meat does an ox eat? And I'm like, oh, wow, that is actually a really profound question, you know, because it doesn't eat any, but yet it is still this tremendously strong and powerful thing. So this kind of shines the light that we really have kind of been programmed, you know, through marketing and different things that meat has to be a substantial part of our diet. And I think a lot of people are running into trouble with that because mm -hmm. I know a lot of people who they don't eat organic farm, you know, open farm, they're eating heavily processed meat products and they look unhealthy and probably are to a certain degree or another. So it's like, mm -hmm. how, you know, how do we combat? I guess that's why we connect with people like yourselves to really educate ourselves beyond what we've all been taught to one degree or another growing up. Mm -hmm. you know, how do we move beyond some of that programming that has really been put within so many of us? I think it's just learning more, learning more about what optimal health feels like, not what it looks like, because I can't tell you how many of my patients have a great appearance. And they're like, I'm in shambles on the inside. I feel awful. Um, you know, we're, we're now seeing, unfortunately, so many young actors dying of cancer, uh, which is, you know, an inflammatory condition, so many of bowel cancers as well. So really separating the two, it, just because it looks good, it doesn't mean it feels good. So learn what it is to feel truly good and thrive. Um, learn to interpret your blood results or work with a care team who can help run regular labs so we can see how's your metabolic system how's your cardiovascular system is anything trying to give you a little alert sign so that way it doesn't just shut down or break down so really asking those questions to yourself am i just trying to look at what looks good or am i actually trying to get data on what feels good and what is actually good for me and good for the people around me who i love and how can, you know, I, I noticed in some of the information I looked from you, you talked about prebiotics and postbiotics, mm -hmm. probiotics. How can those help us to, in essence, optimize that gut, that microbiome within ourselves? And this is where we use our garden analogy. So, we, you know, if you're a gardener, if you love gardening, everyone in some form appreciates gardening because without it, we wouldn't eat for the most part. So, you know, we appreciate the soil and the soil microbiome. And it's a perfect analogy for our gut, right? So when you are fostering a healthy garden, you look at someone's garden where, I mean, everything's green and there's color and they're growing fruits and vegetables and it looks beautiful. It's abundant. It's abundant. You look at another garden that's just the dirt is hard and you know, there's nothing really growing. And so really that is our gut. So the prebiotic is that soil. It's that compost. It's that healthy medium where we're going to plant the seed, which is a probiotic and it'll grow and make fruits and vegetables, which are postbiotics. So 
that's our gut in essence, right? So really we can get probiotics from our environment. Even going on that hike, visiting nature, we get mm. probiotics. We're constantly breathing and tasting and experiencing and touching microbes all over us. But if they're going into that hard, empty garden, they're probably gonna just get blown away by the wind or not really plant and take root. If they're going in that lush green garden with healthy soil, they're gonna get planted, take root and start to grow. So we can do this with fermented food as well. We highly recommend people mm -hmm be just regularly consuming fermented foods. We can't say that enough. There is a massive deficiency in lactobacillus and probiotics in people's guts, which are causing problems. But yeah, that is that is the analogy to kind of simplify it and just- And if we have some there. tangible takeaways with the probiotic mm -hmm. foods, you know, studies show four to six servings a day. So with each meal and snack, trying to get in a little bit of probiotic, whether that's some kombucha, some miso, some tempeh, it could be kefir, it could be, you know, yogurt, dairy-free yogurts, um, getting one in with each meal or each snack. And then there's really strong data to show that those who eat 30 plus plants per 30 different types. So 30 plus different types of plants, fruits, vegetables, nuts, beans, seeds, grains, legumes, herbs, and spices, they have a really robust and lush garden, gut garden. So really start counting your plant points, every herb, every spice count. So just count how many different beans have I had, how many different veggies, and then add your probiotics on that. You really can't go wrong with those two. But if it feels wrong, again, like James said, that tells you that the soil is off. So we need to work on remedying that. Then you can start planting all those great prebiotic or those great probiotic seeds and then your gut will give you those gifts back because it really does want to give you those fruits and flowers it just sometimes needs because. a little bit of help <laughs> that's excellent so all right here's a question it's kind of like okay this is probably on for my own want and desire to know this <laughs> what do you do with the person like i'm amazed when i see your videos on your social media platforms and your daughter is eating and she's happy, man. She's like, yeah, I got broccoli, man. I'm like, so good to go. It's like, what do you do with the person that's finicky? What do you do with the person that's got, like, I can think of my own experience. I could probably have gone to therapy over cauliflower because my <laughs> mom used to serve me these huge servings as a kid. And at that particular point in time, you know, I thought a oh, cauliflower looked like a brain, you know, I don't want to eat cauliflower. And it's like, you know, how do you work beyond some of those mental blocks that come in from eating these types of foods that obviously we're discovering are so good for us and can help us to create a more vibrant life? What do you do with, with that type of mindset? So, you know, with our daughter in particular, we really knew what we wanted to foster from the very beginning. So with her, we really just introduced her to all of these whole foods and that was food to her. The other things were fun. And again, we'd visit them sometimes out of the house, but they weren't a part of our everyday life. So she wasn't comparing a cauliflower to a piece of pizza because pizza wasn't really living in our house all the time. It was like, oh, cool. When I go to a birthday party, I'll eat that. But that wasn't something that she was super exposed to. For her, food is these unprocessed plant foods. And she truly does enjoy it. And now that, you know, she's almost nine, she understands I'm an athlete and I want to nourish myself as an athlete. And these whole foods help me improve my recovery and my performance. So if I'm eating a lot of fun foods, I'm not going to thrive as an athlete. Um, so now she's really starting to understand that on a higher level and a performance level. But if it was somebody who maybe didn't start with that, we can go back to the beginning. Okay, if you have an unhealthy relationship right now with cauliflower, maybe there's a little cauliflower trauma that you've had. Um, let's start with what you do enjoy. Maybe you enjoy cucumbers. Maybe you enjoy tomatoes. Let's start just by adding the things you have a healthy relationship with. You know, there are certain veggies I don't want to eat all the time, right? I don't, I don't really love raw cauliflower either. And I think as parents, we forget they're people too. So if James was hovering over my shoulder saying, eat that raw cauliflower, I'd be like, no. And I'd have a bad relationship with cauliflower. Um, so it's not putting that pressure on yourself, adding things that you do enjoy having until your palate starts to shift and then you start enjoying a larger gamut of them. And we always say, if you maybe one thing isn't your favorite, I try not to say I, you don't like it, right? To kids and adults, because it plants that seed in your mind that you don't like something. But if it's not your favorite, try a different taste, texture and temperature with it. Cause maybe you love broiled cauliflower with different spices on it. Um, so try changing that up. And if at the end of the day, you tried all those different things and it's still not your favorite, 
that's okay. There's other things that you can be trying. So it's really just improving your relationship and the frequency with those foods and not trying to force yourself to down these things that are unpleasant to you. Yeah. No, that's awesome. I feel like there's hope for me and maybe there's hope. my youngest daughter, you know, because of, there are, those are just those certain things. You know, I'm like, I'm like, even to this day, I still have my issues with cauliflower. You know, it's not on my favorite top 10 list for sure. You know, so that's interesting because I know a lot of people, you know, have, you know, issues. They don't want to eat some of these different types of foods that obviously could be beneficial for them. So there is a mental thing. And I liked what you said about having the adjustment to the palate over time, shifting, focusing on things you do like to eat and then. So there's even a movement, it sounds like even people's palates begin to expand upon things that they yep. can eat. Okay. Yeah, so I, I will add, I mean, yeah, just to expand on that, your oral microbiome will shift your taste buds. We know that from studies mm -hmm. where as you shift what you're eating, you're shifting the microbes in your mouth, which will shift your tongue and your glands and your, your, uh, your yeah, I mean, so much. So yes, it can evolve, it can change. And then another point is that also keep in mind, kids are extremely smart. If you are introducing some new and healthy whole plant foods and they, if they whine enough time, maybe it's the second time or the third time, and then the dino nuggets come out of the freezer, they will continue to do that, they right? They recognize that pattern. <laughs> They'll see the pattern. Kids are, we are, humans are adapted to pick up on patterns and kids are those primal new beings that will pick up on those patterns immediately. So even us as parents, it's just about being strong. It's really taking that analogy that Dahlia said of who's living in your house? What foods are living in your house? Are, do you want these foods living in your house or should these be outside friends that we visit, right? So that way, even if your child opens a freezer, he's going, wait a minute, where are those dino nuggets? It's, it's, you know, I'm seeing more frozen fruits and vegetables, but even there's even great veggie patties as well. Like we're not going to sit here and say, we don't oh, use frozen, frozen foods. Options. There's so many great frozen options where you can still get the benefits of the plant foods using whole real ingredients, but it tastes and looks maybe a little bit more appealing to kids and to others and just going from there. So, mm -hmm. yeah, there's always hope. Yep. <laughs> what would you say is the number one thing that um, you wish more people knew when it came to creating this healthy, vibrant internal environment within ourselves? What would that be if you're going to share the one thing? I, I think for me, it would be every single meal can actually influence your microbiome. So that is part of Heal With Each Meal. It's one meal at a time, one step at a time can slowly but surely shift and influence the bugs in your gut, your preferences, and your health. So really don't give up. It's not starting tomorrow. It's just doing it right now. And and kind of to, to show an example of that and to kind of build off that is like, think of it like your skin. When you get cut on your skin, what happens? It heals, right? Our, our, these are epithelial cells. We have gut epithelial cells your skin cells so they're mm -hmm. essentially modified skin cells within our gut so in the same way even if we're damaging the gut as long as we stop it would be like if i keep getting cut here and i keep hitting it and hitting it and hitting it, going man why is my cut not healing well i keep hitting it right so that's what we're doing with food and we just don't see it it's happening on the inside we keep hitting ourselves and hitting ourselves and going man why is my ibs or my ibd or name the chronic disease why is it not getting better well you keep hitting the same spot and not allowing it to heal. So a lot of the times it's like, get out, of, get out of the way a little bit, allow your body to heal, put in the right thing, stop hitting the same wound over and over again. Start and, putting a nice little healing cream, some essential oil, you know, put bandaid on top. And, and, and then you'll be like, whoa, day. you know, when I get cut a week later, it's gone or it's scabbed up and then it's gone. Wow. My gut can do the same thing. I think if people understood that it would, drastically change everything and your so. gut can do that to an extreme power because it has bacteria and other microbes there's 38 trillion bacteria in the gut and you know trillions of other microbes so they're helping that process of healing it's just how are you helping them help them help you <laughs> yeah so typically then people would come to you obviously experiencing some sort of symptom uh you know in their diet in their in their, in their track in their diet in their you know going to the bathroom, all these different aspects. 
and then you kind of take a look at where they're at and then prescribe, I don't, shouldn't use that term, but you offer different solutions to help people to uh, restore harmony to this essential part of themselves so they can start creating more vibrant health. I mean, is that pretty much, what are your main services that the two of you are offering to people to help them to restore harmony to their gut yeah. microbiome? Yeah. yeah, I would say in one word, like what it's professionally called medical nutrition therapy, right? So that that's what we do as registered dietitians, medical nutrition therapy. For us, it's different things. If you go to marytalk.com, you'll see our e-guides. You can make one-on-one -on -one visits where we dive deep into what's going on in your life. Let's your health story. Exactly, your health story and go from there and then build you a customized action plan for XYZ disease. Or even if we get families that are just like, I want to make sure I'm doing this prevent. right mm -hmm. and prevent, right? So we have diet, we have six dietitians, including Dahlia, who all have various specialties. Some kids are family, metabolic, women's hormones, emotional Cancer. release cancer. Um, and then Dahlia and Rachel are dietitians who specialize in really chronic and severe GI issues and, gut health, and yeah. gut health. So we have, and then we're launching our program that is very much focused on uh, chronic GI conditions like SIBO and IBS. So you, then you can do a program where it's at your own pace and getting our resources. We even have, go for it. If yeah. You're just the person who's like, I'm not ready for all that. I don't want yeah, to talk to you. I don't want to do any of that. Let me just sprinkle something on top of what I'm already doing. You know, we recreated gut nurture. Um, we partnered with Compliment and they like to complement a great diet. Um, so gut nurture is just an everyday pre and postbiotic. So again, it's helping to reshape the soil. It's not a seed. It's not the probiotics but we're really just helping to reshape the soil. So if you're somebody who's trying to prevent issues, if you're somebody who has issues, you want to keep your soil healthy, you want to get your soil healthy, uh, we created this for that person it, too. It's unique in a sense of it's it's something that's not out there. And going back to the analogy of like, I think my garden's a little empty and bare and hard. This is like a little compost supplement, right? Yes. It's, it's, a, it's a soil supplement, unlike anything out there where everyone's trying to do the probiotics, you need the seeds or the postbiotics here, take this. Mm -hmm. No, this is, this is about really getting to the root and going, let's help your soil. Right? And we're super grateful. It's actually sold out right now, but we'll make sure to get you some when it's yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. And then you guys have a book too. What the good gut A to Z book. Yeah. So we have let's our ebook. It's all about A to Z. So whether it's for a family, whether it's for an adult, a person who's just trying to get better. One thing that I used to hear from people when I would take them on grocery stores, store tours was, all right, that was cool, but I'm going to bring this home, put it in the drawer and it's going to go bad and I'm going to throw it away. So good gut A to Z helps people understand how to eat these foods A to Z. What do you do with that rutabaga that you bought at the grocery store? How do you cook it? Where did it come from? We talk about uh, where these foods originated, um, who eats them throughout the world, how you can prepare them, what the nutrients in them are and how they benefit your gut. So we really just want to, again, help people eat and tolerate more plants. But if you're not eating them because you're not sure how to, how do you know if you tolerate them or not? And it's really some of our favorite plants just over the now over a decade of doing this, yeah, like kabocha squash. I wish I learned about kabocha squash earlier and learned how to prepare and eat it because it's so delicious it's one of my favorite foods let alone my favorite type of squash and just things like that where like are you being exposed to this and you know it's it's right there your local grocery store or farmer's market and now you have a recipe and now you know about it and now you can taste it and eat it and if you're mark and you don't want to eat cauliflower guess what there's over you know a hundred other options in there to where you can yeah. flip through it and say well okay i do want to try that kabocha squash james was talking about or i yeah. do want to try that um, heirloom tomato or i do want to try some of these other options that are in the book so it's all about options we're all about options we think Just we're all unique and we need just that. that right there alone that there's an alternative <laughs> to cauliflower i mean yeah. I in my day there's hope uh, i'm gonna call my mom i'm gonna tell her see man there's alternatives to cauliflower you can diversify <laughs> <For> some more therapy <laughs> yeah <laughs> so how can listeners connect with you and and um find out more about what you're doing. I know we had talked about that you have a little gift that people can get and I'll give, I'll share that link in a second, but how can people find out more about what you two are doing and, and learn more about how they can revitalize their health and well-being? 
Yeah, you can find us everywhere at marriedtohealth.com or Married to Health across all platforms. And uh, yeah, I'm pretty much there. You can become a patient. You can find more of our resources, whether free or uh, paid. And you can connect with us on Instagram, YouTube, all across all social platforms mm -hmm. at Married to Health. All right. And then you had mentioned the fact that you have a kind of like a preview, something I'll share a yeah. link here. It was marriedtohealth.com forward slash preview. And this is, what is this and, and how can people get this? Yeah, so this is a preview to our Good Gut A through Z guide. So you'll get a couple of recipes. It's free. Check out the preview. You can download it for free that we could see at least the first uh, couple dozen pages of it. And then if you want more, you're like, I like these recipes. I like what this is about. Then you can purchase the rest on marytalk.com. Mm -hmm. And it has a tracker in it so you can say what. And you can track what you tried, A through Z. All right. So I want to encourage everybody to go to marriedtohealth.com forward slash preview. Make sure you get your copy. I'm definitely going to check it out because just because I'm definitely <laughs> feeling like I need to upgrade my garden a bit. Conversation. <laughs> but, I, you know, I, I just want to kind of end with this thought. You know, our health is everything. And we know we live in a world where the quality of food that we're being presented with isn't providing us with the optimal health really that we deserve or that we need to be able to move forward to fulfill our purpose, to make our dreams come true and to accomplish the things that are so important for all of us to accomplish. So I'm excited and thankful to have the two of you on to share what you're bringing. We definitely went down a couple of different avenues I wasn't expecting, which I, like I said, I've never gone down that avenue before, but there's a first time for everything. It's certainly a subject matter that we all can uh, relate to, to one degree or another. But once again, I invite you to go to check out married to health.com and check them out on social media and uh, educate yourself and discover how you can create more vibrant health and um, just revitalize every aspect of your life. So thank you too for taking the time to hang out with me today. And even though on some levels, I feel like a rookie, but I definitely got some, I got educated today and I'm thankful. <laughs> I appreciate it. Awesome. Thank, Thank you, you so Love much. It. Such great questions. Such great conversation. We look forward to seeing you soon at yoga. <laughs> <laughs> Take care.